come on in, pull up a chair and relax because today I will be reviewing and paging through Rough Nights and Hard Days for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. This is for the latest edition of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay from Cubicle 7 Entertainment. So is this a must-have collection of classic tales that are loosely tied together into a campaign? Or is this just a bunch of musty and tired old adventures that could have stayed lost? We'll take a look and I will share what I think right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I'm Jeff McAleer, back once again as your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned in the open, I'm going to actually review and share a page through of Rough Nights and Hard Days, which is a collection of five classic Warhammer Fantasy roleplay adventures, which are written by Graham Davis. As I mentioned, this is from Cubicle 7 Entertainment. And alongside Graham Davis, it's also written by Andy Law and Ben Scary, with artwork provided by Andy Law, Fernando Isamo, Jonathan O'Donohue, Mark Gibbons, Mateo Spirito, Mitchell Nolte, Ralph Horsley, Sam Manley, Scott Purdy, and Victor Leza. The 96-page book is available in hardcover from Cubicle 7 for an MSRP of $34.99, which does include the PDF, or you can snag the PDF itself over at DriveThruRPG for $19.99. So let's swing on over to the other camera and start paging through rough nights and hard days. Here we've got Rough Nights and Hard Days, Five Grim and Perilous Scenarios by Graham Davis. This is a hardcover. It is for the latest edition of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Taking a look at the back here, it says, Let me tell you of the Graven Maria Ulrich von Liebwitz of Ambestein and her deadly quarrel with Baron Otto van Dammenblatz. It's unlike any tale told before a truly epic drama to astonish and amaze, featuring evil witches, profane demons, deceitful assassins, and murder most foul. And of course, the biggest draw of them all, an evening at the opera with the Grand Countess of Nuln, as Detlef Schirk, the finest actor the Empire has known, entertains us all on stage. This is a story worth the telling, so draw close and let us begin. So let us begin. We're going to crack this open. I really do dig the, the layout here, the spread of the, uh, the Reichland. Very nicely done. We get this on the back cover as well. So we are seeing the House Abenstein, uh, like, heraldry, I guess we'll say, right? So jumping on in here, we get a bit of a forward. We get an introduction. So these adventures all appeared elsewhere at some point in time. And originally, the five tales were not intertwined. So what Grant Davis has done is he has actually kind of beefed up these adventures, kind of given them a thread that runs through them so that you can run these five adventures together as a bit of a campaign. You can also utilize this book if you're planning on running the Enemy Within Director's Cut, which is coming soon from Cubicle 7 Entertainment, you can actually utilize these adventures within that as well. So talks a little bit about the, uh, the various different adventures itself. In fact, even here it says talking about the Enemy Within campaign and running the adventures, NPCs. And we start off with a rough night at the Three Feathers. So this is where the player characters are going to meet up with their new patron. They're going to be introduced to their new patron. Well, she'll be their patron if they play their cards right. 
So basically, the adventure begins where the player characters find themselves at the Three Feathers Inn, and there are a variety of non-player characters who are staying at the inn, or visiting the inn, or up to no good at the inn. And I'm going to try to stay as spoiler-free as I possibly can through this. Now, taking a look here, you're going to see that each of these adventures are going to have a timeline which is going to break down exactly what happens and when and if and how the player characters might be able to impact this timeline. Of course, this isn't set in stone. The Game Master can decide what they want to take place. Some folks are really going to like this aspect of each of the adventures. Some Game Masters may find it to be a little too restricting. But then again, if you think about it, many of the like older, old school, renaissance sorts of adventures, even today, modern adventures, are a bit of a railroad. They, they tend to kind of push the player characters in a specific direction. So regardless if we actually have a timeline or if we just have it just laid out by the author, it's, you know, kind of like half a dozen of one, six of one, half a dozen of the other, right? So we are introduced to some of the important non-player characters within. And one of the aspects that I really like about all of these adventures is that there are things going on behind the scenes with these non-player characters that the player characters themselves are not aware of and they may never be aware of. And I appreciate that because a lot of times we see even important non-player characters in role-playing games are created basically just as foils for the player characters. They exist in no respect outside of how do they affect the player characters or how do the player characters affect them. Whereas here, these, these NPCs are going about their own business and will continue to go about their own business regardless of many of the things that the player characters might do. So I really, really did dig that. Then we get into the, uh, the second story, A Day at the Trials, because uh, it turns out that the player character's new patron is actually on trial. So uh, it is a trial by combat. And once again, we do see breaking down. Okay, so what's happening at 10.15 a.m., 11.30 a.m., 1 p.m.? Kind of give you that breakdown here. We get more of the important non-player characters once again. One thing that kind of threw me off a little bit is some of the artwork's in color. And much of it is just in black and white. And I would have liked to have seen either sticking with full color or just going with black and white. Because it's it just looks strange. A Night at the Opera, if I understand correctly... This was a pretty popular adventure for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay previously, in previous editions. So hopefully the uh, player characters have helped their patron as far as the trial, and she has been found innocent. If so, they are going to celebrate with a night at the opera. And there are no Marx Brothers involved with this, but there is quite a lot going on, and there are quite a lot of non-player characters. So here we have the Grand Countess, who is supposed to be one of the most beautiful women in all the Empire. And of course, the player characters can meet with her. So there's a lot of opportunity for the player characters to interact with a slew of NPCs, all with various different objectives, that they're looking to accomplish. That's another aspect of these adventures that I like is that everybody has kind of their own objectives, their own drives, and they don't necessarily have anything to do with the player characters. Then the player characters may find themselves at a wedding. And of course, the wedding will not be going off without a hitch. That's for sure. But as you can see, we get we get like color artwork for kind of the main NPC for the adventure, 
and then everything else is black and white. Now, I do understand that I'm sure some of this artwork is being utilized from the original adventures and that they may have been published in black and white uh, because I know I think two of the adventures in here actually appeared in, uh, I think they, they were in White Dwarf magazine. All right, then we get to the conclusion, the wrap-up of the campaign with our fifth adventure. And there are, it, it's pretty funny, because you've got, you've got assassins, you've got cultists, you've got dueling noble houses, uh, that, and it's all kind of just running through as kind of underlying story arcs throughout the five adventures. I have to say that uh, Graham Davis did a really nice job tying the adventures together without making it where you can't simply utilize the adventures as standalone or insert them into your own campaign. We also have two appendixes at the end, or appendices, I think some people pronounce it. So first off, we get a new culture for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. We get gnomes. And I found it interesting that in the Empire that uh, many people don't believe gnomes actually exist. And uh, if they see a gnome, they assume that the gnome is simply a halfling. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So we get into that. Then the second appendix is pub games, which I found this will be useful, especially in the first adventure at the Three Feather. But we get a listing of various different pub games that are popular throughout the Empire. So I thought that was, that was pretty cool, too. Nice little addition. So all in all, we get about 80, what, 85? Yeah, 85 pages of adventures. And then the final few pages here are uh, the breakdown of gnomes and allowing the player characters to play as gnomes, as well as the pub games. And that is what we find inside Rough Nights and Hard Days. So let's switch to the other camera and I will tell you what I think and give it my review score. Okay, what are my overall thoughts about Rough Nights and Hard Days? I think you probably already got the impression during my page through that I really do like this adventure collection. It's not perfect. I do have some quibbles with it, and I will get to those in just a moment, but there is a lot to like. Number one, it does harken back to the days when Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay was aiming to try to put together adventures that were not complete railroads. And I know there are folks out there, I've seen comments on my own RPG reviews, where People think that a railroad is basically kind of part of the social contract the players make with game masters in order to play a role-playing game. I don't really feel that that's the case. That's not to say that there aren't aspects of these adventures where it's kind of like, well, the player characters are going to find themselves in this situation or that situation. It's just each of the adventures does feel like they all have much more open-ended, sandboxy approaches as opposed to, hey, I'm the game master, I'm going to tell a story, and you're coming along for the ride, regardless of what your characters do or not. So big plus for that. I do like the fact that there's a lot of things going on in these adventures that the player characters and the players themselves aren't aware of, and they may never be made aware of. I like that little background detail that the world is moving. There's a, you know, mechanisms going on behind the scenes that the players and player characters don't know about and may never find out about. So I do like that, that little extra level of detail. I also like the fact that many of the non-player characters don't revolve around the actual player characters, which is unusual because a lot of times we do see in adventures where the NPCs have no lives whatsoever outside of how they interact with the player characters. So there's also a kind of a, a, a constant kind of beat to each of the adventures that, that are very, very similar. 
Some people will not like that fact. They will think that it's a little too much repetition. But I like the fact that it's, you know, a lot of these adventures are basically saying, okay, at this time, this takes place. At this time, that takes place, and so on and so forth. Giving the Game Master plenty of information of what's actually going on, regardless of what the player characters happen to be doing themselves. Of course, this doesn't mean that the player characters can't impact these timelines. Of course they can. But I do like the fact that the the decision, the design decision that Graham Davis made back in the day when he wrote these was to try to see if he could put together almost like an Agatha Christie sort of mystery adventure. Not to say that these are mysteries, but where everything is kind of paced, where this is going to take place, that takes place, this takes place, and so on and so forth. I do like that. I also appreciate the fact that for the most part, each of these adventures have loads and loads of information to help make running the adventures so much easier for the game master. That said, that does bring up one of my negatives too. One of my quibbles is that in some respects, there are points in some of the adventures where it's kind of like, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just wiping my hands of the game master and you kind of do whatever you think is right. Which I thought was a little odd seeing that uh, there's, there's a good amount of kind of hand holding throughout most of the adventures. And then suddenly it's kind of like, well, you're the game master. You decide what's, what happens or, or how many enemies that the, the players are going to tackle and things like that. I thought that was a little bit strange. Another small quibble that I have happens to be that, as I mentioned, some of the stories, even though the plots and that are different, there is a bit of a, a repetition as far as the structure of each of the adventures. That didn't bother me that much. I can see that some game masters, it will bother quite a bit because I'll just feel that it's too samey, I guess I'll say. The other uh, negative I have, which I'm going to have to ding the final score a bit because of it, is I think price-wise, $34.99 is a bit high. This is a 96-page book. Sure, granted, it's hardcover. The, the adventures are good. Uh, it's got a lot of black and white artwork, which... Okay, I understand why, because a lot of these adventures, these adventures are all being reprinted from years ago, uh, and I don't believe there's a lot of new artwork that's been included in this, but still, 35 bucks for a 96-page hardcover book. At that price, we normally will see 150, 170 pages. Even the PDF itself is a little higher price than I would like to see. It's $19.99 over at Drive-Thru RPG. I would say something like this, I would prefer to see in the vicinity of about $14.99. None of these are like, you know, deal breakers or anything like that. I mean, you're going to get plenty of play out of these, uh, especially if you're planning on maybe jumping into the Enemy Within campaign that's coming soon the kind of director's cut, the revamped edition. These adventures will fit in really well with that campaign. So don't take my, my quibble with the price as like I'm trying to say, oh, this isn't worth it. It certainly is. But I just would have liked to have seen it priced a little bit less. That's all. Anyway, overall, I certainly give Rough Nights and Hard Days a very, very solid 8.9 out of 10, it is certainly worthy of being added to your Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition collection, that's for sure. All right, so that's it for this episode. Once again, let me remind you, be sure to catch The Daily Dope, which streams live on YouTube Mondays through Fridays at 7 p.m. Central Time, where I bring you all the latest tabletop gaming news. Yeah, it's fit to print, or I guess fit to talk about. Anyway, once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, happy trails.
Hey, hi, I didn't realize that you were still here. You must be sitting waiting for YouTube and its infinite wisdom to actually autoplay you your next video. Well, if that happens to be the case, I only have 20 seconds for me to be able to provide all this info to you, so get ready. If you'd like to subscribe to The Gaming Gang, click right here. Or if you'd like to check out the latest episode of The Daily Dope, click right here. Or if you'd like to check out a randomly selected video, click right here. Once again, I'm Jeff MacLear, and thanks for watching.